So welcome to tonight's community meeting for the Silver Line Extension Alternatives Analysis. We're going to allow a few extra minutes for people to join, and we will get started soon. So thank you for your patience. Gracias por estar aquí esta noche para la reunión relativo a los alternativos de la extensión de la línea de plata. Vamos a esperar algunos momenticos porque algunos participantes todavía están llegando. Gracias por su paciencia. So, hello everyone. Laura, can you uh, move to the next slide? So, welcome to tonight's community meeting for the Silver Line Extension Alternatives Analysis. My name is Reagan Cecchio, and I will be serving as the moderator for tonight's meeting. Next slide. I would like to note that all MBTA activities, including public meetings, are free of discrimination. The MBTA complies with all federal and state civil rights requirements, preventing discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, limited English proficiency, and additional protected characteristics. We welcome the diversity from across our entire service area. If you have any questions or concerns, please visit www.mbta.com forward slash title six, that's title VI, to reach the Office of Diversity and Civil Rights. Next slide. I also want to remind everyone of the rules for participating in this meeting, as well as let everyone know that this meeting is being recorded. It is also being live streamed on Everett Community Television and Facebook. Before we can begin the meeting this evening, I want to review a few technical aspects of the Zoom platform. Next slide. We have an interpreter tonight who is translating the meeting into Spanish. If you require this service, please click the interpretation button on your screen and select uh, Spanish language. I'm now going to ask Emily, our Spanish language interpreter, to say a few words. Emily? Buenas noches y bienvenidos a todos. Mi nombre es Emily. Estoy aquí para proporcionar servicios de interpretación al español. En un momentico vamos a encender la función de interpretación. Entonces va a haber un icono de un globo al fondo de su pantalla. Hacer clic en el globo y escoger Spanish. Si se está conectando con móvil, empuje los tres puntitos. Ahí escoge Interpretation. Pues Spanish, pues done. Y ya está conectado. Gracias. So at this time, I will ask all English language speakers to please select English as their chosen language. And I will do the same um, as we speak. Um, this will allow us all to hear translated non-English comments during the Q&A. Next slide. Great. So you can view closed captions by clicking the closed captions feature and selecting from the options shown. Show subtitle will display a caption at the bottom of the screen. View full transcript will display the meeting's audio transcription in a window to the right. Next slide. All, attended, all attendees are muted during the presentation to prevent excessive background noise. 
And if you're viewing the meeting on a computer, you can toggle speaker view to see the presentation more prominently. Um, if you are on a smartphone, you can swipe to change views. You can also use the Q&A button to submit a typed question or comment at any point during the meeting. We will be monitoring the Q&A during the presentation, but we ask that you hold substantive comments and questions for the question and answer session that we will be having later in the meeting. If you do have a technical problem, please share your issue in the Q&A at any point in the meeting and we will respond as quickly as possible. The questions you submit are not going to be visible to attendees once they're submitted, but we are going to try to read them aloud and get to as many as possible um, later in the meeting. I'll also note that the chat is open during the meeting and visible to all attendees. Please use the chat if you want to make comments you want to share publicly, but please use the Q&A for the questions for the project team. Um, I will flag that presenters likely will be not be responding uh, to these questions or comments in the chat until the presentation has concluded. And I also want to say that if you use inappropriate language, either verbally or in written form, you will be removed from the meeting. And now I will turn it over to Doug Johnson. Thank you, Regan. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Doug Johnson, and I am the MassDoc project manager for the Silverline Extension Alternatives Analysis. The purpose of tonight's meeting is to share the results of our analysis with you, talk about the next steps for this process, answer your questions, and get your feedback. We'll start with an update on this project, provide an overview of our evaluation and the results, and then end with next steps. As Reagan uh, mentioned, we will have a Q&A session following the presentation, and we will start the Q&A session with comments from elected officials. And I do not, I see there is a question in the Q&A feature in Zoom. Um, someone asked if participants will be allowed to speak to ask their questions at the end of the meeting. The answer is yes. Um, when we get to the Q&A, folks will be able to raise their hand um, and we'll allow you to unmute yourselves and ask questions, um, but we will start the Q&A session following the presentation with uh, elected officials who are in attendance. Next slide. For those who have been following this project um, as it has progressed, the first few slides will be familiar to you, but I'd like to remind everyone of what the study is about, why we're doing it, and the work we've completed since our last public meeting. So the purpose of the Silver Line Extension Alternatives Analysis is to assess the feasibility, utility, and cost of extending the Silver Line from Chelsea into Everett and potentially beyond. Next slide. The Silver Line Extension Study builds off of prior studies and projects that have been completed over the past few years, um, including back in 2012 and 2013, the Silver Line Gateway Study, which recommended extending Silverline service to Chelsea from South Station. In 2015, construction of the Chelsea Busway began, and in 2018, SL3 service began operation. During that time, the Everett Transit Action Plan was published, which recommended extending Silverline service from Chelsea into Everett. And in 2019, the Lower Mystic Regional Working Group, group also published a report that recommended extending Silverline service from Chelsea into Everett. And in that case, that report recommended extending Silverline service both to Kendall Square and to downtown in Boston. The intent of the Silverline extension study is to figure out exactly where Silverline service could go and the potential benefits and costs of implementing that service. Next slide. This slide shows the remainder of our schedule. We are most of the way through this process. We just held a meeting of the project working group and a recording of that meeting is available on the project website. We anticipate holding the final public meeting for this process this winter. So there's still some work to be done before this process is complete, but we anticipate holding that final public meeting um, this winter, potentially late January or early February. Um, and then we intend on concluding the study this spring. Next slide. 
Since our last public meeting and working group meeting, we've finalized our list of alternatives and substantially completed our alternatives analysis. We also held in-person outreach events in Everett, Chelsea, and Somerville uh, this past fall, and we published an online feedback form, which is still open and can be found on our project website. We'll provide a QR code for that later on in this presentation. Next slide. Now I'm going to go through the study's evaluation process and talk about the different alternatives that we looked at before turning it over to Teresa Carr to discuss the results of the analysis. Next slide. This image shows an overview of our process. We started off the study by looking at all of the previously proposed ideas for new transit services within our study area, and then we screened out the ideas that did not meet our project purpose and need. We then looked at all of the potential alignments a service could take, essentially what the path of travel of that service would be. We evaluated those alignments, selected the ones that performed best based on our tier one analysis, and then we put those alignments together into full alternatives to analyze. Um, as I mentioned, we have now substantially completed that tier two evaluation, and you can see where in this process where we are now. Next slide. So what is the tier two evaluation? In this part of the process, we looked at seven complete alternatives, developed service plans for them, and then evaluated them against our goals and objectives, which I'll say more about in the following slides. I would like to note that we are not recommending an alternative at this meeting, but we anticipate making recommendations based on our final analysis this winter. Next slide. This slide shows the seven alternatives that we've analyzed. They're grouped together by alternatives that we analyzed as extensions of the SL3 and those that we analyzed as a new service, which we refer to here as SL6. Um, and I'll show each of these individually in the following slides. Next slide. These are the three SL3 extension alternatives that we analyzed. They all follow the same path to Everett Square from the existing SL3 and commuter rail station. From Everett Square, we looked at three different options for getting the SL3 to the orange line. The first alternative one takes the SL3 to Malden Center by way of Ferry Street. The second alternative, um, takes the SL3 to Wellington by way of Route 13, uh, Route 16, excuse me. And the third alternative takes the SL3 to Sullivan by way of Broadway. Next slide. These are the four SL6 alternatives that we analyzed. Alternatives four, five, and six all originate in Everett and connect to Sullivan Square. And then from there, alternative four connects to Kendall by way of McGrath Highway in Somerville. Alternative five connects to Kendall by way of Rutherford Ave in the Gilmore Bridge. And alternative six connects to Haymarket by way of Rutherford Ave. Alternative seven is different from these other three alternatives in that it originates at the Eastern Ave SL3 station in Chelsea, then uses the Chelsea busway and the SL3 alignments to Everett Square, and then connects to Sullivan Square and Kendall um, using the same alignment as alternative four. I also want to note that for the purposes of our analysis, when we did travel demand modeling, that's a process to figure out um, potential ridership for all these services. When we did that modeling, we assumed that the SL3 would be extended into Everett Square so that we could see what the potential transfer activity would look like between the SL3 extensions and the SL6 alternatives. Um, with one exception in the case of alternative seven, which you see here on the right-hand side, that assumes that the SL3 continues to operate the way that it does today um, because the SL6 would duplicate the extension into Everett Square. Next slide. So how did we actually analyze these alternatives and what did we measure? When we started this process, we developed a list of goals and objectives based both on public feedback 
and the transportation plans produced by the different municipalities in our study area. So that's Boston, Chelsea, Everett, uh, Cambridge, Somerville, um, Medford, and Malden. We looked at the plans produced by those municipalities to inform the goals and objectives that we then developed at the beginning of this process, um, which basically allow us to figure out how these alternatives would be successful in fulfilling both the goals of MassDOT, the MBTA, and our participating municipalities. Within our objectives, there are measurable evaluation criteria. Those are the actual metrics that we use to determine if any of these alternatives do a good job or not of meeting our goals and objectives. And we'll go into detail of those in the following slides. So next slide, please. We have five main goal areas uh, that our metrics and evaluate or excuse me, our objectives and evaluation criteria nest under. Those goal areas are expanding mobility and access, advancing equity, improving safety, supporting climate change resilience and sustainability, and advancing feasible and implementable solutions. Next slide. So this slide lists the evaluation criteria that are associated with each goal area. In this case, these are the individual metrics um, that we use to measure to what extent the alternatives did a good job of expanding mobility and access, advancing equity, etc. You can see that these are things like projected ridership, access to jobs, uh, ridership for transit-dependent populations specifically, changes in greenhouse gas emissions, the cost-effectiveness of um, the different alternatives, how much transit priority would be incorporated into those alternatives, et cetera. If you'd like more information about each of these metrics, you can watch the recording of the last working group meeting, which is available on our project website. At that working group meeting, we went into detail about how each alternative performed on each one of these metrics. What we'll present Tonight in the following slides will be a high level overview of the results. And if you'd like to see more details of it, you can watch the recording of that working group meeting. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Teresa Carr, uh, who will go through the results of the analysis. Thank you, Doug. So let's dive into our evaluation findings. Um, and we want to hear from you. Your feedback on this project and our findings is super important. We invite you on the next slide to scan the QR code that you see on your screen with your phone. You can also go to mbta.com slash SLX feedback and provide us with your input as we walk through evaluation findings. You can also put thoughts into the chat here in Zoom. The online feedback forum walks you through the alternatives as we're about to walk through them. And we'll ask you your thoughts on each one. This forum is available through mid-January, but we think it's a great way for you to send us your thoughts in the moment this evening, if you're able. And to iterate something that Doug said earlier, we know that we're presenting a lot of information tonight. We've tried to make it as high level as we can, and yet still we acknowledge that this is a challenge. There are no bad questions. Just please put your questions in the chat or in the Q&A, and we'll try to address them at the end of our presentation tonight. And as Doug mentioned, we won't be able to moderate the chat during the presentation, but we can moderate the chat once the presentation is over and that discussion part of tonight begins. So let's start with the SL3 extension alternatives. These remember are the ones that extend SL3 from Chelsea Station to the Orange Line. They are the same in that they all share a common alignment between Chelsea Station and Everett Square. 
the commuter rail right of way to Second Street, Second to Spring, Spring to Chelsea, and Chelsea Street to Broadway. Once they are at Broadway, they branch out. Alternative one goes up Broadway and along Ferry Street to reach Malden Center. Alt two goes to Wellington Orange Line Station via Broadway and Route 16 and the connector. And Alt three goes to Sullivan via Broadway and Lower Broadway and the Alfred Street Bridge. And there are some things that are true for all of these alternatives. So I'll stay on this slide for <clears throat> another minute. All of these alternatives increase ridership on the SL3 by a lot. This is between 90 and 150% when we compare that with what we call the no build condition what we anticipate that things would look like in the future, the year 2040. Now that's doubling the ridership on the SL3 and it's an indication that we are providing a high quality connection to the orange line. We also believe that we can make a high quality investment in bus transit priority between the Chelsea busway and Everett Square regardless of alternative. And third, that the SL3 can be extended to the orange line with the current Silver Line vehicle fleet. And on the next slide, we go on a little bit. We have some additional things that are true for all of our SL3 extension alternatives. And these include that investments in bus transit priority will take safety into account, including pedestrian and bicycle access to stations, and it's expected to improve safety in the area, so along the alignments between the stations as well. <clears throat> All of the alternatives provide great access to jobs, all kinds of jobs, within what we would define as a reasonable 45 minutes in this case, transit ride. And lastly, there was no alternative for the SL3 extension that showed a dramatic difference in transit mode shift. So that's the overall percentage of trips that are taken by transit when compared to driving, walking, and bicycling. And that's not true um, for the SL6 alternatives, just so you know. So in the next slide, you can see an overview of our evaluation results on one slide. Now the rows on this table are our evaluation metrics. And the columns of this table are the three SL3 extension alternatives. The color ramp here shows that nothing performs badly. White is neutral. And the darker the green, the greater the performance. We ask you to please try to refrain from counting green squares. There's a correlation for sure between uh, color and performance. But as we discussed earlier in this meeting, some of these metrics were more meaningful than others. And things that I want to um, call out here include, under this first goal area of expanding mobility and access, there's two key pieces. First is ridership. All of these alternatives have high ridership, but there is higher ridership for alternative one to Malden Center and alternative three to Sullivan than there is for alternative two to Wellington. Also travel time reliability here is higher for alternative three to Sullivan. This makes sense as Alternative three has the highest level of transit priority. So the extent of the alternative that we are able to put the Silver Line buses in dedicated bus lanes and have other priority at intersections. That does have um, a, a, a direct correlation to reducing our overall transit travel times and especially when drive times are congested. Under advancing equity, 
all alternatives serve what we call transit critical populations. This is the definition that we've shared with the bus network redesign process. And it includes um, uh, looking in particular at um, uh, people of color and people with lower incomes who may be more reliant on transit for all of their trips. Um, Work-related trips for sure, but also trips for healthcare, for shopping, for other appointments, um, and for entertainment. Now, the more that the alignment is used by additional MBTA bus routes, so that's in addition to the silver line, um, the greater the overall travel time savings is when we add it all up. Because we know that bus routes in our study area carry more people of color and people of low incomes. This does equate to an equity benefit. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are no major differentiators on improving safety. We have confidence that all alternatives would be in a position to improve access and safety, both along the alignment and at stations, and in particular for more vulnerable users. And here, what I mean is um, bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, we do see that connectivity to the existing and planned bike and ped network is good and can be improved. And all alternatives help support climate change resilience and sustainability goals. When we look at costs, so this is our final goal area here about um, feasible and implementable solutions. The cost estimates that we developed in considered design assumptions and what we call unit costs to develop some planning level, high level cost estimates. Where we could assume that things were done by others, we did that. But if we couldn't make the case or if it was unclear, we assumed those costs under the Silver Line Extension project. All SL3 extensions show some level of cost effectiveness, but this is an area where Alternative 3 stands out with the potential to add bus lanes along Lower Broadway and Everett in particular. Now, this next slide shows some trade-offs for each of the alternatives. It is organized like a table, like the previous slide, columns are alternatives, rows are findings, but this one boils down the findings into what really makes a difference. And in terms of where the alternatives perform really well, Alt-1 does really well in terms of ridership overall and ridership for transit critical populations. Where this alternative doesn't do as well as in transit travel time, and its ability to provide transit priority along Ferry Street in particular. Now, the reason is because that street is not wide enough for big bus lanes, and there aren't any parallel corridors that would be candidate corridors um, that have this width. Instead, we do the best we can by providing small bus, bus priority treatments at intersections where possible. And the other piece here is the Ferry Street Reconstruction Project, which is funded. It's in the queue for construction. It would improve pedestrian safety by putting in curb inter extensions at intersections. And Alt-1 does carry a cost of going back in after this project, um, removing those curb extensions and replacing them with those small transit priority investments that I was just talking about. Alt-2. Going to Wellington does really well in cost effectiveness, and that's because it doesn't really require much in the way of new construction beyond Broadway. Where it doesn't perform as well is in ridership and the benefits that come with transit priority. We don't see the ridership demand as much as the other two alternatives, and there's less transit priority beyond Broadway, which makes the transit trip similar to drive times. And when the stretch of roadway is congested, the buses are caught in the congestion too. Alt-3 performs pretty well, really well on all the metrics, including ridership. Where it shines is in transit travel time reliability. 
we are able to assume a higher percentage of bus priority on this alternative than we are on the others. And this results in shorter transit travel times and a greater advantage when compared to driving. And it's the reliability of this transit travel time, which can be more important than the travel time itself in terms of setting um, schedules and setting expectations. There are also a lot of local buses that could use this transit priority investment so the current 104, 105, 109 being able to get out of traffic. That's a lot of existing transit riders that can benefit from that. There is construction in this alternative, but potential to do the construction once and mainly within the existing roadway footprint. So that was the SL3 extension alternatives. And now I'd like to dive into the results of the SL6 alternatives. And this is alts four, five, six, and seven. And we start with a reminder that these all connect Upper Broadway and Everett with either Kendall or downtown Boston. And they do it in somewhat different ways. Alternatives four and five connect Everett and Kendall and are identical in their alignments to Sullivan but they differ past this orange line connection. Alternative four travels along Washington and McGrath to Lechmere, whereas alternative five travels down Rutherford and over the Gilmore Bridge to Lechmere, and then beyond into Kendall Square. Alternative six connects Sullivan to Haymarket via Rutherford and North Washington, and then finally, as Doug mentioned, alts four, five, and six all assume that the SL3 is extended to Everett Square, which allows for a transfer between the SL3 and the SL6. And this is different in alt seven because that one aims to connect Chelsea and Kendall via a one seat ride, not requiring that transfer between the SL3 and the SL6. So it actually starts at Eastern Ave, just to be closer to the center of Chelsea. And it travels along the Chelsea busway um, and then up Second Spring, Chelsea and Broadway to Everett Square before, before following the general alignment of alternative four to get into Kendall. And what is true of all these alternatives is that they all provide tremendous access to jobs. We're talking about providing a connection to Kendall Square and providing a connection to downtown Boston. They all do really well in terms of the level of transit priority that can be provided. And they're all expected to improve safety, especially the safety for our most vulnerable users, cyclists and pedestrians. And on the next slide, you can see some other things that are true of all of these um, SL6 alternatives. These really move the needle on transit mode share for all trips. This is, as I mentioned, a significant connection and it truly can result in fewer cars on the road. And they all rely on or work with investments that are expected to be made by others. And furthermore, that these investments are happening outside of the Silver Line investment process. This includes reconstruction projects at Sullivan Square and as planned along Rutherford Avenue and along the McGrath Highway. And the next slide shows an evaluation summary table for the SL6 alternatives. And what we see here first is that ridership to a Kendall destination is higher than to a downtown Boston destination. Boston is a major destination, but the connection at Sullivan, what we saw is that we have some riders transferring to the orange line at Sullivan under alternative six instead of staying on the silver line. Travel times through that transfer were a bit smaller than staying on the Silver Line, 
And this was not true for any of the alternatives that connected with Kendall. Second, we saw that the overall Silver Line ridership is pretty stable between the other alternatives, alternatives four, five, and seven. These are all within about 5% of total ridership numbers of one another, and they reflect the quality of that connection to Kendall and less the specific alignment to get there. All the alternatives do great in terms of providing high levels of dedicated bus lanes. We're talking in general, more than three quarters of each route, which would be not, which would not be mixed with other traffic. This lends itself to really competitive transit travel times and truly excellent travel time reliability. In relation to our equity goal, all the alternatives serve populations that rely on transit. In general, we see that all buses can take advantage of the bus lanes, which do result in substantial reductions in overall bus delay when you add it up from all the bus routes that um, would travel along the alignment. Now, similar to the SL3 extension alternatives, we see that all the alternatives are expected to improve safety and support climate change resilience and sustainability goals. And with all the alternatives, we see that we need to expand the size of the Silver Line fleet. And that has impacts on where we store and maintain those vehicles. It varies a bit between alternatives, between a need for nine new vehicles versus a need for 13 new vehicles to operate the service, but running any of them would require um, or expected to acquire new vehicle acquisition, as well as the expansion of maintenance facilities to accommodate them. We see reliance on work that's underway by others. Um, as I mentioned, Sullivan, um, Rutherford Ave, um, McGrath, and depending on the commitments assumed by others, this has benefits to what we call um, cost effectiveness. And on the next slide, um, we have a little bit of the same pros and cons of each of the alternatives, just at a very high level, what makes a difference. And we see that alternative four does really well with over, overall ridership. When we combine SL3 and SL6 ridership, it does have the most riders, as I mentioned, within 5%, but the most riders among all the SL6 alternatives. While it does have the lowest extent of transit priority, it still shows great potential for travel time reductions as well as great travel time reliability. Um, that's for the Silver Line 6, as well as overlapping um, MBTA bus services. This alternative also um, has the potential to share some of the reconstruction costs, McGrath Boulevard Redesign Project. And where it doesn't do as well is serving a, a, a known travel flow for our low-income riders and riders of color. And this is a, a little bit of a difficult one to discern because that transit trip today is really difficult. And so it could be that what we're seeing is a bit of a chicken and egg. Improving the journey could open up new opportunities for different kinds of trips. Um, but we do need to report that out. Um, also, we are struggling a little bit at fitting in um, dedicated bus lanes in Kendall um, proper. And because that is an area with a high level of activity, this does impact our buses um, and travel time. And especially um, that is looking at the afternoon time frame and buses leaving Kendall Square. So that's something that really impacts any of all our alternatives that are serving uh, Kendall Square and certainly something that we, we would be hoping to um, refine through our next steps. So alternative five, has uh, similar impacts and benefits to alternative four, um, but the key differences here relates to travel over the Gilmore Bridge. So just remember, this alternative is different in how you get to Leachmere from Sullivan. And alternative five is going down Rutherford Ave and over the Gilmore Bridge before um, moving up to go to Leachmere. It's a slightly shorter route um, than alternative four, it connects Everett to two Orange Line stations, one Green Line station, and the Red Line at Kendall. 
Um, by nature of it being shorter, it has slightly lower travel times than alternative four um, and a slightly higher percentage of transit priority. But we do see, just like alternative four, um, we do see those delays while circulating around um, Kendall, especially in that afternoon outbound movement. Also, the Gilmore Bridge can see some congestion. Um, we did, after cons consultation with uh, several stakeholders, make a policy assumption for modeling that we would have bus lanes in each direction on the Gilmore Bridge and a station at Community College. But we don't have the cost effectiveness benefit of assuming that this work is being done by others. We assumed those costs as part of the Silver, the Silver Line Extension Project, if that makes sense. Now, alternative six goes to downtown uh, Boston to Haymarket via Rutherford. It's the only um, SL6 alternative that connects Everett directly to downtown. And it performs really well in several areas. The level of transit priority, access to jobs, ability for other transit to use priority treatments, and potential for cost sharing with the um, Rutherford Avenue reconstruction project that is um, in development. Where alternative six doesn't do as well is in ridership. Um, the projected ridership for this alternative is about a third lower than the other SL6 alternatives. And as I mentioned earlier, we see that this is because there are so many competing services between Sullivan and downtown. Our ridership modeling um, did assume the implementation of the red line transformation, the orange line transformation uh, projects, and um, the overall transit uh, travel time um, is a little bit shorter with a transfer to the orange line at Sullivan than staying on the silver line for this alternative. And this final alternative is providing that direct connection from Chelsea to Kendall. And um, just a reminder on this alternative, um, it starts at Easter now, so it's getting from the center of Chelsea all the way to Kendall with a one seat ride. And for, um, uh, for this alternative, we did assume that both the SL3 and the SL6 we're operating in the Chelsea busway um, between that Eastern Avenue station and the current Chelsea terminus. This does make it the longest alternative. It does um, great on ridership. It does great on extent of transit priority and potential for cost sharing. It has all the same uh, benefits as alternative uh, four. Um, it is very similar in terms of performance to alternative four. Um, we did see that it was the most expensive route in terms of fleet requirements and operations, just because you have that duplication of service in the busway. But we do anticipate that we could tweak this, like where do the SL3 stops, where the SL6 starts. Um, this is a, a finding from the evaluation process um, that we have right now. Um, we also have the same travel um, time concerns coming out of Kendall Square as we see with alts four and five, um, especially in that outbound afternoon um, period. So that's the evaluation and I want to talk a little bit now about community outreach. Both what we have been doing and where we're headed. I do want to share that shortly we will be sharing the results that we've received on our online feedback form that we received earlier this fall. And what we will be showing you is everything that we've heard before we started presenting on evaluation results. So if you do have that open and you've been working on your form, I just wanted to give you that warning because we don't want seeing the results that we've tabulated so far to unduly influence you and your own thoughts um, and input uh, based on tonight's presentation. We will be considering all of the results of the uh, all of the input received on the online feedback form from when we opened it this fall all the way through to when we close it in January. So we start with a quick overview of the community outreach effort that has been going on par with our technical analysis. Over this past summer and fall, 
we conducted outreach to stakeholders and to our study area communities. We held tabling events and we handed out postcards in Everett, Boston, Chelsea, and Malden. We developed a project booklet and we opened this online feedback form in three languages. And the next couple of slides show some of our preliminary results. And to point out here, um, the date that we summarized and created these charts is November 22nd. And as of that date, we had received 141 responses uh, to the question about the SL3 extension alternatives. And I want to talk a little bit first about the colors that you see on this screen. They represent the three SL3 extension alternatives, where red is alternative one to Malden Center, purple is alternative two to Wellington, and blue is alternative three to Sullivan. And when asked how likely um, they would be to use each of the SL3 extension alternatives, Respondents have said that they um, would be more likely to use SL3 from Chelsea to Sullivan, but surprisingly very unlikely to use the alternative one to Malden Center. And the alternative two to Wellington received the most neutral um, responses here. And this next slide shows SL6 alternatives. And what we have heard up to November 22nd, same date, um, same color scheme applies, but to different alternatives. Red is alternative four to Kendall via McGrath. Purple is alternative five to Kendall via the Gilmore Bridge. Um, blue is alternative six um, to Boston, uh, from Everett to Boston. And green is alternative seven, Chelsea to Kendall. We received 130 responses to this question up to the mid-November. And as you can see here on this chart, alternative seven and four received the most responses in relation to ones most likely to be used. So now I'm gonna turn it back to Doug to talk about our next steps. And we have plenty of time for Q&A and comments and discussion. Thank you very much, Teresa. Um, as you are now all well aware, that online feedback form is available on our project website and it will be open um, into January. So we encourage folks to spread the word about the online feedback form. We'd like to get as many responses through it as we possibly can. So please feel free to share it with your friends, neighbors, colleagues, um, constituents, if they're elected officials in the audience, we like to get as much feedback as we possibly can before we actually finalize the results of this process um, and start considering potential recommendations that could be made in early 2023. As we mentioned earlier, the next external working group meeting and public meeting are anticipated to be held this winter, um, potentially late January or early February. Uh, so please keep an eye out for the meeting announcements for those. Um, we publish announcements about the meetings for this project uh, through email and on the MBTA website um, and through press releases. So if you get email updates about this project, um, you will receive a notice in advance when the final meetings for this project are scheduled. Next slide. Now I'll turn it over to Reagan Cecchio, who will moderate the Q&A session. Reagan. Thanks, Doug. So before we open the comment and question segment to the public, we would like to invite any elected officials in attendance or their staff, municipal staff, um, to ask questions or make comments, please use the raise hand feature so we can recognize and unmute you. So any electeds or municipal staff members that would like to make comments? Okay. 
So I think we've gotten a lot of chat comments and a lot of questions in the Q&A, some comments, some questions. I think, Doug, if it's okay with you, I'm going to start with the questions um, as people can see the comments and the comments are being shared um, publicly. And um, I will note that all comments that we will put them into the public record as well. Um, so um, even if I don't read them out loud, we are we do see them. Um, Laura, can you go to the next slide? So here are some instructions for tonight. I know I went through some of this earlier, but in case you join late, if you would like to share a written comment or question, you can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And we're gonna alternate between reading questions and comments already submitted and recognizing those who wanna pose a question verbally. Um, I will ask you uh, to be brief so we can hear from as many people as possible. Um, I also want to note, I think people can't see the attendance. So we have 47 uh, members of the public in attendance tonight. Um, if you want to share a question or comment verbally, press the raise hand button. If you are joining on the phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star and the number nine. All attendees who speak Spanish, please raise your hand to provide your comments and questions verbally for the interpreter to hear and repeat your comments. When I recognize your name, you will be unmuted and you may speak. And after you share your comment, we will lower your hand and you will then be returned to the muted state. Please speak slowly so our interpreters can capture your comments. So with that being said, I think, as I mentioned, we're going to start with some of the questions that we got first. Um, Heather Hoffman had a question. and. Um, about whether there are possibilities to incorporate better access to desired destinations other than jobs, like affordable grocery stores and government offices like courthouses. Um, she says, for example, the Middlesex County Probate Court is, according to the MBTA trip planner, more than a mile from public transit. That's a great question, Heather. Thank you. Um, so we had two metrics that we used. Um, sort of related to this. The first was access to jobs and the other was access to affordable housing or number of affordable housing units um, within a certain distance of any of our alignments. And both of those, or more specifically the jobs access metric sort of serves as a proxy for access to different types of destinations. Um, employment centers, shopping centers, places like that. So we didn't look at it at the really granular level of individual grocery stores or hospitals or government offices. Um, we used a, a sort of more generalized metric, the access to jobs, because um, I think that that gives us a better measure of the benefit of each alternative rather than looking at sort of individual destinations. Thanks, Doug. Um, so Samuel Pierce has a question that I think is both in the Q&A and in the chat um, about whether there's a possibility to allow for subterranean tunnels being built for the Silver Line, like the South Station, South Boston model. Thank you for your question, Samuel. Um, we did not look specifically at tunnels um, or structures in this process. Um, when we looked at alignments early on in that tier one phase of this process, uh, we assumed that Silver Line service would uh, remain on terra firma, so to speak. So in the SL3 extensions, we looked at the extension of the existing Chelsea busway, and then we have on-road bus facilities um, throughout the alternatives, but we did not look at tunnels or other structures, um, primarily because of the cost associated with those structures. Okay. So I think I'm going to turn, we still have a lot of questions, but I know some folks have had their hands raised for a while. So I'm going to turn to Ralph Walton. Shana, can you unmute Ralph? Ralph, you should be able to speak. Ralph, 
Can you hear us? Okay. So maybe, Re oh, Reagan, since there's only four more questions in the Q&A, I'd say let's go through all of them and then. Sure. And I think there's a few in the chat too, though. I do want to make sure we capture too, but yes. Yeah. Um, so I will go to Michael's uh, question from the chat. Um, Shana, can you mute Ralph again? And Ralph, if you want to raise your hand again, um, we might be able to catch you on the other side if you're having technical difficulties. Uh, Michael says, why can't the Wellington alternative convert a lane of Revere Beach Highway to a bus only lane? So that's a good question. So in the all in the Wellington alternative, um, service comes down Broadway, then uses the Santilli connector, which runs parallel to Route 16 into Santilli Circle, and then over the Route 16 bridge to Wellington. When it goes over that bridge, it would be using the right hand travel lanes, which are currently right turn only lanes because they feed into the on and off ramps for the bridge um, to get down into the Wellington station. So it, we would not be able to make those lanes bus only. They would have to continue to operate the, the, way, the way they do today, which are turn only lanes. So we don't, because of the need to connect to the Wellington Orange Line station, there isn't really an opportunity to convert lanes on the Route 16 bridge to bus lanes. Um, and I should also say too that um, this is sort of related to the question about tunnels as well. Uh, we did look at ways to incorporate bus lanes into Santilli Circle, but we did not look at really like wholesale reconstruction of roadways or dramatically altering the nature of roadways um, for a similar reason to not considering considering tunnels, which is just the major cost element of implementing that kind of infrastructure. For the Silver Line 1 and 2, which have a tunnel from South Station into South Boston and then onto the surface roads of South Boston, that tunnel in South Boston was built before the seaport was built out, um, whereas obviously except under South Station, because that was always there. Um, in the case of these alternatives, these are very heavily developed urban areas. So it wouldn't be the same process for building a tunnel as it was in South Boston. Um, so we opted not to consider cost elements like that. Thanks, Doug. Um, I want to note in the chat, there is a question from Dan Jaffe about what bus type um, is going to be used, diesel, electric, LNG. Great question. So these, our assumption is that we would be using the enhanced electric hybrid buses that are currently replacing the existing Silver Line fleet. So the MBTA is in the process of replacing the whole Silver Line fleet with um, a type of vehicle known as enhanced electric hybrid bus. Uh, the difference between that and the existing buses is that they don't connect to the catenary, um, or excuse me, they do, I'm trying to remember exactly the <laughs> specifics of this, um, and Teresa, maybe you can jump in if you are more familiar with this than I am, um, but we would, we're assuming we're using the enhanced electric hybrid buses, um, so they, sort of a hybrid model that has a diesel um, and electric power source. So these are not battery electric buses, um, which is something that the MBTA is moving towards on sort of a longer timeline than we were considering for implementation of these services. So that's the reason why we limited ourselves to the existing or in procurement Silver Line fleet. Got it. I like the affirmation from Teresa there. <laughs> I, uh, I appreciate it. It's been, sorry, it's been a while since I've thought exactly about the answer <laughs> to that question. All right. So uh, I'm still trying to get through it. We had a little bit of a backlog of questions in the Q&A, and then we will turn to folks with their hands raised, I promise. Um, Peter had asked, do the models for the effect of transit priority assume good compliance with an enforcement of bus-only lanes? And is there evidence that there would be good compliance? 
That is a great question. Uh, thank you, Peter. We do assume 100% compliance with the bus lanes. Um, the Our model isn't uh, minute enough to consider you know, percent of compliance, but I will say that different types of transit priority have different levels of compliance associated with them, sort of the nature of the infrastructure. So center running bus lanes, like you'd see on um, Columbus Ave in Boston or the Chelsea busway, um, I think it's very safe to assume extremely high compliance with that infrastructure. Side running bus lanes, uh, like you see in many locations around the Boston area, have a lower level of compliance depending on the adjacent land uses. So if there's a really high demand for pickup and drop off um, on the curb, then you'll see less compliance with observing a side running bus lane. So the type of infrastructure that's assumed in any given segment of these alternatives um, varies and it depends. We did an analysis for each segment to see what type of infrastructure would be able to fit within that right of way and what would make what would be feasible. Um, so in some locations, we were assuming center running bus lanes. In other locations, we were assuming side running bus lanes. So in the cases with side running bus lanes, in reality, it would likely be lower compliance, depending on the adjacent land uses, than you would see with center running bus lanes. And if I could add to that, um, just a, a, a little nuance, um, everything Doug said it is perfect. Um, and we also um, looked at different um, literature in terms of um, where we got those assumptions. And basically um, looking at FTA and at NACTO and looking at MBTA and other peer systems in terms of what kind of travel time benefits we can get from different types of transit priority uh, treatments. And so we worked those specifics, as Doug mentioned, center running versus side running, side running bus lane versus a, a short um, bus lane. Um, running in general purpose, um, having transit signal priority at intersections, each kind of transit priority treatment had a little bit different um, in terms of travel time, travel time savings, and how that differs from just being out in a regular uh, travel lane with cars. Okay, thank you both. Actually, Laura, do you mind going to the next slide? Just so we have the, does that have the, um, oh, it has the email on it. I actually could, if you could find the slide with the um, website on it, um, just so people have that in front of us. Sorry to be a pain. Um, Natalie's question was, how many routes will be selected? So is it one of the SL3 options, one of the SL6 options, or just one out of all of the SL3 and SL6 options? That's a great question. Um, we have some additional analysis that we need to do before we can make any uh, final recommendations. But for for the SL3 options, we were thinking of them as being mutually exclusive. Um, that is to say that if we were to make a recommendation, um, we anticipate we would recommend one out of the three SL3 alternatives, um, not more than one of those, uh, considering that in theory, the SL3 can only do one of those things. Um, and if we were gonna do more than one of those things, it would have to be a service different from the SL3. Uh, for the SL6 options, those are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, however, as Teresa mentioned earlier in, in the presentation, the timeline on any SL6 alternatives um, would necessarily be longer than the SL3 extensions because according to our analysis, we do not currently have the buses to run the service or any of the SL6 alternatives. And for many of those alternatives, uh, the availability of transit priority is dependent on other efforts that are underway, namely the reconstruction of Rutherford Ave or the reconstruction or and the reconstruction of McGrath Highway. So for the SL3 alternatives, we were anticipating um, recommending one out of the three, not 
uh, likely to be more than one uh, for the SL6 alternatives. Uh, it, it will be based on the results of our analysis, whether we're recommending one or more of any of them. Uh, I will say that the additional analysis that we intend to do is to model a combination of SL3 and SL6 alternatives to see how they would perform together. And that's a necessary step before we get to the point where we can make recommendations for SL3 and SL6 services. All right, that's my home phone ringing. I apologize if you can hear it. Um, thank you, Doug. So I, there's a question in the chat, although I will urge people if they have questions to put them in the Q&A, it helps us track them better and comments can be in the chat. Um, for Bruce, alternatives four and seven are listed as not performing well in terms of travel time, yet they do perform well in terms of travel time reliability. Could you please explain the distinction? Yes, thank you very much, Bruce. I'll take a stab at this and then Teresa can tell me if I'm interpreting this incorrectly. Um, great question though. So travel time reliability is a function in our analysis is a function of the extent of transit priority. So for alternatives um, four, five and six, actually really four through seven, uh, there was a, a lot of transit priority assumed in those alternatives. We assume center running bus lanes all over Broadway, transit priority getting into Sullivan, um, and then either on Rutherford or McGrath. But in those two alternatives that went to Kendall, um, there we noticed in our modeling that there was a lot of delay for those services getting out of Kendall Square and heading back northbound on some roadway stretches where we did not assume transit priorities. So we're continuing to have conversations with the city of Cambridge about what it is safe to assume for transit priority circulating through Kendall Square. Um, but for those alternatives where we said it performed well in, in travel time reliability, but then we also said it performed poorly on travel time, that was, it had a lot of transit priority essentially. So it performed well on the majority of the stretch of the alternative and then ran into a lot of delay around Kendall Square that affected the overall travel time um, and made it worse. So Teresa, please feel free to ask. Yeah. No, that's great. And and that's, it's definitely something where um, we, we're trying to be realistic in terms of what we can assume, assume in terms of where bus lanes can go in. And we just have a, in, in terms of that circulation, just some real constrained environments and a lot of things that are going on and lots of modes that need space for safety, for mobility. And um, so we, we did go ahead and assume that our buses would be um, running in, in just general traffic. Um, and it did, sadly, especially in that afternoon heading out of Kendall Square um, direction, have some travel time impacts. It is something that <clears throat> we would look at refining. As, as Doug mentioned, we are in conversations with the City of Cambridge. What can we assume? assume do we need to be so conservative um, in terms of um, uh, not putting in transit priority. We also um, have the potential of maybe looking at maybe a slightly longer circulation where we would have the, the transit priority. So this is what I would consider like a, ref a refinement. Um, Doug mentioned we have um, one more step in our process, um, another model run. That's a perfect example of an area where we'd want to drill down and see how can we make that work because we are seeing um, sadly, some travel time impacts from just that short stretch of not having the um, transit priority. Doug. So I know there's still a few uh, questions in the Q&A, but I do want to uh, take some verbal questions. Um, again, I will urge you to keep your questions or comments uh, brief so we can hear from as many as people as possible. Um, I think Dan Jaffe will be first. Shana, can you unmute Dan, please? Hi, folks. Um, 
I'm very concerned of the traffic implications uh, in Charlestown. Rutherford Ave is a major thoroughfare for uh, the, the commuters coming from the regional areas. And we have to jump across that as well as integrate into that. Uh, your plan for Rutherford, uh, as well as Gilmore, implies that you're going to have a dedicated bus lane. And uh, we have a pinch point that uh, in the current road, as well as the current design that we have working from, uh, a two lane limit uh, right at the um, eastern side of Sullivan Square. You can't create a third lane there. Uh, it's just not conceivable. Um, and the other plausible direction, which I, I don't even want to go into, is a surface only design uh, for Rutherford Ave. And that introduces even harder hardships for us uh, because the volume of that regional traffic is so in intense that uh, we'll never get across then. So um, I sort of realize that you're in, in a tight bind here, but to be honest with you folks, I don't see Rutherford as being a viable direction for you. And I also don't see uh, the Gilmore either because it too is limited by encroachment of structures on both sides of it. So it's a two lane affair, each direction. And the amount of traffic that's going into Cambridge is just too sizable for you to steal a lane away. And so it's on the one lane. And that again, starves us of one of the only few ways in and out of Charlestown. Because remember, we have the, the commuter rail that we have to jump across there. So I, I really want you to come back to Charlestown explicitly to the community as a whole, not just Sullivan Square, to really hash out the pros and the cons of what your plans are if we go down Rutherford Ave. Because frankly, I, I don't see it working here uh, in any form without going with a tunnel, in this case, a tunnel for traffic. Uh, not you, but uh, that's the only way to soften the surface for a, a bus uh, service to run down Rutherford. And obviously that's, you're not gonna do that either. It's too expensive and uh, long-term costs, but that's where I'm at. And I've done a lot of work on this. Uh, I realize you, you have a problem and I'm not trying to say otherwise, but I, I can't see you going down Rutherford without killing us. Thank you. Thanks for coming down. I should note that this study is not intending to dictate what the final form of Rutherford Ave or McGrath uh, Highway look like. So we were we had to make assumptions about operating conditions for the purposes of um, modeling ridership and doing our analysis. Uh, but the intent isn't for this process to say what those corridors should ultimately look like in terms of number of travel lanes or whether there's overpasses or underpasses, um, anything like that. So in terms of the performance of any of the SL6 alternatives, uh, we modeled a particular condition. And if the roadway were to look like what we assumed, then you know we're confident in the results that our analysis produced. But Obviously, it's possible that the, you know, the Rutherford or McGrath planning processes, if they result in different final designs than what we assumed, then the results for this amount for an analysis would be different. Um, so not our intent to dictate what Rutherford looks like in the future, um, but we did assume transit priority on the corridor for purposes of our analysis. Thanks, Doug. Thank you, Dan. Um, I think, Shana, if you could unmute Adam, had his hand raised. Adam? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Hi, my name is Adam. I'm a resident here in Everett um, with a young family. Uh, I'm calling to advocate on behalf of the Glendale Square area. There's a few um, alternatives <clears throat> that show starting or going through Glendale Square on both uh, SL6 and SL3. I really think that this area needs servicing um, or public transportation. It's a high density area. Um, and you know, for the people of Everett, Everett Square is already being serviced by pretty much all the options, whereas only a few uh, touch on Glendale Square. Um, if, if the people in this area need to get down to that, to, to Everett Square, you're talking about potentially walking up and down Broadway. 
which is a pretty big hill, and especially in the you know the winter time or the summertime, that's not easy for for all the uh, residents here. Um, you know, as as you know in Everett, they're getting rid of a lot of the parking permits, so people are going to be much more reliant on public transportation. And I know that the lower part of Broadway is being built up, but I just want to make sure that people remember the residents that are already here. Um, they, they don't quite have the access that the lower the lower Broadway gets. Um, you know, my some of my neighbors take uh, public transportation to work every single day. I'm fortunate enough that I drive, um, and so it's. But I really think this area needs um, a lot of attention. So my my recommendation, there just for comment, is the SL6 Alternative Four. Kendall uh, via Union Square. You have two two job points to access there. I think that's fantastic. Um, the uh, SL6 uh, alternative six number two going to Boston, then the SL6 alternative five to Kendall via Rutherford, and then finally SL3 alternative one, which goes uh, via Glendale Square to Malden Center. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, I think we're going to turn to Darren Costa. Shana, if you could unmute Darren. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, perfect. Um, I actually, I tried to raise my hand a little bit earlier. I'm actually Darren, um, I'm a city councilor in Ward 3 of Everett. Um, so I, like Adam, am calling to advocate. I tried to raise my hand, but I have a baby with me. So you may hear a little bit of babbling. Um, but I do have a couple of questions to ask, if that's okay. Totally fine. And babies are always welcome. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I, I heard some mention of some capital infrastructure plan within the project for the Gilmore Bridge. Is there any discussions happening between your organization or others within the state about improvements of, for example, Sweets or Circle, or someone had mentioned Rutherford, um, or even the Alfred Street Bridge and widening, whether that be done through you know, public or, or private funding? Because I know the Encore continues to build in Everett also. Uh, great question. We did not look at um, widening any bridge structures specifically. Uh, I will say on Lower Broadway, we worked really closely with the city of Everett to figure out uh, a cross section uh, for Lower Broadway and a type of transit infrastructure that would be able to fit within um, either the existing or potential future right of way. So for Lower Broadway, uh, we developed a few different concepts for transit priority. And we did assume that the number of general travel lanes would be maintained uh, for the majority of the corridor and, and bus lanes will be implemented uh, on it. So in that case, we weren't limiting ourselves to the existing like curb to curb width that's there. Uh, but for the Alfred Street Bridge and Gilmore Bridge, uh, we did not specifically look at widening the structures. Okay. Um, so also in in being um, recently appointed a city councilor in Everett, I've noticed, for example, there are a lot of alternative options, like even through the Encore having private party transportation. Um, does the MBTA work at all with some of these and maybe they're unique, maybe there aren't many others, um, but is there some sort of marketing that happens that kind of crosses between any private public transportation? Um, and, and, and on the, the inverse, you know, how does the SLX adding more buses to the street um, affect things like in your consideration of the bus lane, do you include, for example, the Encore buses? That's a good question. For the modeling of these alternatives, um, my recollection is that it did not include, it's not uh, really like minute enough to include something like do Encore buses use bus lines on lower Broadway um, and what impact does that have on general travel? Um, but if bus lines were to be implemented on lower Broadway, I'm sure that there would be um, a lot of discussions between the various participating agencies about who, what vehicles would use those lanes and what the impact of that would be on the various services. So I can't say with any certainty right now sort of what the determination would be. 
<laughs> okay. I, yeah. And I guess I'm speaking a little bit beyond modeling and more so kind of on advertising. And, um, I, and I'll just ask my last question. I'm sorry to take up so much of your time. I just want to say thank you also for um, everything you've put together and um, so kindly uh, explaining it to everyone. Um, but one of the statistics that's really stuck out to me about Everett so far has been um, the fact that 70% of people rely on cars. And like Adam mentioned before, um, they're motivating uh, development without traffic. They've passed laws in the last 18 months um, that require very little to no need for off-street parking for a lot of the buildings built. Not many of them add it, but at a ratio of, you know, 50%, um, certainly many of them less than one for one for uh, each bedroom, for example. Um, so um, has, within your analysis, did you, as part of like advanced equity, you know, especially for a place like Ever, I'd assume trying to motivate more people to rely on the MBTS, MBTA would help. And the more coverage we have on the streets of Everett, I believe that that would help in, you know, guiding Everett to a lower or a better statistic when it came to people relying on cars. Because again, I think neighboring cities were in and around 40, 30%, like Somerville, Cambridge, where Everett was closer to 70%. And that, that's a number I got from the transportation di uh, director at Everett. So um, when you're considering how much, um, you know, square footage or square mileage of Everett to, um, to service, did you also consider um, the advanced equitable effect of having that availability um, and what it would do to getting some cars off the street? Because we, we already have a large congestion issue um, in, in different areas of Everett. So um, I, I believe that having better and more reliable service coming through Everett will possibly lead to less cars being on the street. And thank you all. Yes, uh, thank you very much for your comments. Uh, to your final question, the answer is yes. There's a couple of different ways that we looked at that. Um, one is, one of our metrics is mode shift. So that's the um, change in the mode of transportation that folks use from a future condition in which the Silver Line service is not extended versus a future condition in which the Silver Line is extended. And we did this for each one of the alternatives to see, uh, based on our model, how much mode shift there would be with each one of these. Uh, we also looked at the travel patterns of uh, folks we refer to as transit dependent populations. And that includes folks who have um, either low access to personal vehicles or no access to personal vehicles. So those are likely to be folks who are already riding public transportation, which isn't necessarily the folks you were referring to because um, you're talking about people who own cars and are using them. So for the mode shift metric, that does directly get at um, measuring to what extent we could shift folks out of single occupancy vehicles and onto public transportation um, if we were to extend the service. And if I could, um, Doug, just to add on to that, there's a little bit <clears throat> here of if you build it, they will come. Um, at an earlier stage of this project, we looked at um, what we call transit inclination, which is a whole variety of um, things that would make up like this is this an area where if there was higher quality transit connections, it would attract more riders. And yes, some of this it did it pan out in the modeling itself, but there's also just the sheer fact of um, this is providing a high quality transit connection uh, to the Orange Line in Everett. And there's something to be said about that even outside of the modeling uh, process. And so we saw throughout the, much of our study area, to be honest, but very apparent in Everett, very apparent in Chelsea, um, that there are a high percentage of the, the residents that we believe would ride transit if, if, if the quality was, was there, if the connections were there. Thanks, Teresa. Thanks, Doug. I'm going to take a few more of the written Q&A uh, questions for right now. Um, there is a question from David in where he says that uh, anecdotally, Second Avenue has a lot of traffic. If that is part of any route, do you envision dedicated lanes? 
Also, are you considering any of these expansions crossing the Chelsea Street Bridge and continuing to South Station? Why and why not? Yes, we were assuming bus lanes on 2nd Street. Uh, we've been working with the city of Everett to um, figure out what exactly our assumptions can be about the width of 2nd Street. Um, the area adjacent to 2nd Street has been rezoned by the city, that area, the commercial triangle. Um, and as developments along 2nd Street take place, there are opportunities to widen the right of way in order to have bus lanes in the future. So the existing curb to curb width of 2nd does not allow for bus lanes, but we were able to assume based on the conversations that we have with the city that in the future, the as developments modify the roadway, um, we would be able to have bus lanes on it. Um, for the second part of your question about uh, the extensions going over the Chelsea Creek Bridge into South Station, for all of the SL3 extensions, uh, the SL3 would continue to operate the way that it does today. The route would just get longer, essentially. So instead of stopping at the or ending at the Chelsea commuter rail station and market basket as it does today, in all the SL3 alternative options, the SL3 would continue west and then get to the orange line and then turn around and go back um, and go back through the busway over the Chelsea Street Bridge through the Ted Williams Tunnel and back to South Station. So these routes, um, you know, we only showed, we showed the extension getting to the orange line, but we didn't show the fact that the service would continue to operate bi-directionally as it does today. Thanks, Doug. Question from Carlos. Can you clarify the assumption that a potential SL6 would also include an extension of SL3 to Everett Square? Sure thing. Um, in the SL6 alternatives, when we were um, doing travel demand modeling for them, we decided to assume that the SL3 would be extended into Everett Square um, along the path that we showed in all the alternatives. Since all three SL3 alternatives follow the same path into Everett Square, um, we were able or we felt comfortable assuming that portion of the SL3 extension um, in all of the SL6 alternatives. And the reason why we did that is because we wanted to answer the question, if an SL3 extension were built and an SL6 alternative were implemented, um, how would folks transfer between those two services? Obviously, it's a little different if the SL3 makes it all the way to the orange line, uh, but since the path to Everett Square is the same for all those SL3 alternatives, we decided to assume that in those SL6 alternatives when we were doing analysis. That's not necessarily to say that that's how, um, or that's what we would ultimately recommend or what would get implemented, um, that was so that we could model the interaction between an SL3 extension and the different SL6 options. So, Doug, I know it's 7.30, but I think we have three more questions in the Q&A to get to, if we want to just get through those and stay a little bit tonight, if that's okay. Yep, as long as our interpreters are able to stay, we can continue. Okay, great. So Joe Cologne uh, said, how do you plan on adding bus lanes on Broadway Street in Everett, seeing how it currently has only one lane of travel in both directions? Thank you for asking this question. I should clarify um, that I was referring specifically to uh, lower Broadway, south of Sweetser Circle, going from uh, Sweetser Circle to the Alfred Street Bridge. That's where we assumed center running bus lanes while maintaining uh, the existing two travel lanes in each direction. On the portion of Broadway north of Sweetser Circle, um, we assumed the bus lanes that exist today, which are uh, peak only side running bus lanes. So on Broadway today, on that portion of Broadway north of Sweetser Circle, um, in the morning rush hour, there is a, you know, the, the parking and bike lane on the southbound side are converted into a bus lane. And then in the evening rush hour, on the northbound side, the parking and bike lane are converted into bus lanes. So we assumed that the we assumed those bus lanes would exist in the alternatives that are running on the part of Broadway north of Sweetser Circle. Thank you. So there's two questions from Samuel in the chat. 
um, and I'm just going to take them together, <laughs> um, about the possibility of including a connection between Mattapan Square and Nubian Square um, with a goal to create a one-seat service from Mattapan Square to the airport. And then the second question is alternative four loops the Silver Line with Sullivan Square with a new connection to Chelsea. Is it possible to build off the initial infrastructure if the MBTA begins to close gaps in service? Great question. So um, it is, sorry, I'm just bringing your question up. Um, just trying to find it again. Um, Mattapan. So make sure, it. got it. Yeah, thank you. So that I can make sure I answer all of it. Um, we did not specifically look at the SL4 and SL5 service. Um, those were outside of our scope of work. And the reason why is because this study really builds on um, the Lower Mystic Regional Working Group report, sort of the predecessor study of this effort, which was that group was basically convened to look at the future of transportation in the Lower Mystic um, based on the development of the casino and potential impacts to travel patterns and traffic in the area. So um, that group was when the casino was being developed, that group was convened to look at um, what the future of transportation in the lower mystic area um, should look like. And this study follows one of their recommendations, which was to really assess the feasibility of extending Silver Line service in that area. So the SL4 and SL5, um, unfortunately, are outside of the scope of work for this effort. Um, and then your other question, um, was about alternative four that loops through um, Sullivan Square with a new connection to Chelsea. Uh, yes, is it possible to build off the initial infrastructure if the MTA begins to close gaps in service? Um, I'd ask if you can clarify that question if you don't mind, but I think I'll answer it uh, in the way that I think you're asking it. Um, the transit infrastructure that we're assuming would serve any of these alternatives, we also assumed would be usable by other MBTA services. So one of the things that we analyzed, one of our metrics was the extent that transit infrastructure associated with Silver Line extension would improve other MBTA bus services. So we see this effort or the way that we looked at it was really in conjunction with other changes made to transportation in the area um, and other potential benefits to other MBTA services. So it's really part of sort of this iterative process of improving transit services throughout the system. Uh, hopefully that answered your question. Thanks, Doug. And Samuel, I think in the chat, if uh, you can respond and if Doug didn't answer your question, you can let us know. Um, Jane, we have one final question, I think, here, Doug. James has asked, um, what assumptions did your analysis make about future development along the corridor? Um, Everett, south of Broadway, south of the Parkway and on Lower Broadway, Boston, Sullivan Square, Somerville, Union Square, are all in line to get significant commercial and residential growth based on proposed projects, but there's still a lot of uncertainty about what will be approved. That is a great question, and this was something that we had to pay really close attention to because of that uncertainty, as you mentioned, about what would be approved. Um, so the travel demand model that we used is based on the year 2040, and it assumes a certain amount of growth in jobs, uh, population, and uh, households. We looked at the assumptions for 2040 that were that existed in the model. And we decided that we thought those estimates were too conservative and they needed to be increased for the purposes of this study, just based on what we already saw in the development pipelines in the different municipalities in our study area. So we talked to all the municipalities in our study area about the projects that were already in the um, sort of approval process 
uh, projects that had been submitted but not necessarily approved yet, um, projects that were approved but hadn't started construction yet, and projects that were already under construction. So we basically surveyed all of the um, projects that were known to us in various stages of uh, development, and we ended up incorporating those into the model um, because we wanted to, you know, we knew that a lot of that, anything that's in construction obviously is going to be completed relatively soon. Things that are approved are going to go to construction um, within the timeline of that model since it goes out to 2040. So we wanted to assume that that development was there in 2040. So we incorporated that into the model and used that as the basis for our analysis. Um, it is possible, of course, that there'll be even more growth in population and jobs and households than what we assumed in our model. Uh, so we could only assume sort of what was known to us already, um, but it is possible that, you know, future growth could exceed those expectations. All right. So I want to thank everyone for their questions tonight. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Doug uh, for some closing remarks. Um, I do want to respond. So Dan asked one last question in the chat. Uh, what will happen to the bike lanes going across Alfred Street, the Alfred Street Bridge? So in our analysis, um, we assume that those bus line, or bike lanes would stay there. We looked at a few different cross-section options, um, and we didn't want to assume a situation in which the bus lanes supplanted the bike lanes. So in our assumption, the bike lanes continue to be on the Alfred Street Bridge. Um, I should also clarify, too, that on Upper Broadway, north of Sweetser Circle, where there are currently peak period side running bus lanes, in our analysis, we did assume that those bus lanes would be full time, that it wouldn't just be during peak periods. Um, that was because we wanted to assume sort of the maximum amount of transit infrastructure uh, that we could possibly have in these alternatives. Um, and I think that's all of the questions. Uh, so Laurie, can you go to the next slide? That concludes this public meeting. Thank you all very much for attending um, and giving us your feedback and asking your questions. We really appreciate your interest and participation in this process. If you have any questions, you can email the project team at slx at mbta.com. Um, I also want to uh, just um, note again that that online feedback form I mentioned earlier is on the project website and available. Um, we ask that you give us your feedback through that online feedback form. Um, and you can go watch the recording of our last working group meeting on the project website if you'd like more information about anything that we shared tonight. So thank you all very much for your time tonight and look forward to seeing you at the next meeting. Thanks, everyone.